In this video, you're going to learn about six amazing open source .NET projects will help you write better apps. Now, this isn't going to be just a generic list of end units in JSON.NET. Instead, I'm going to look at some of the fringe packages. So regardless if you're a pro or new to .NET, hopefully you're going to find something here that's going to aid you in your development journey. The first package I need to tell you about is Rebus. Now, if you're working in a distributed system and you've got nodes and services dotted around the place and you need them to talk together, Rebus is a package you should check out. So Rebus is an open source .NET service bus. And this means that in your distributed architecture, you can send, transmit and route data between all your different services much easier by using Rebus. Now, granted, there are plenty of service buses on the marketplace. Why should we use Rebus in particular? So first, it's been downloaded over 20 million times. It's simple to set up compared to most other service buses. It's pretty feature rich and the documentation is also pretty good. Now, Rebus supports various different transport providers. So we've got things like RabbitMQ, Azure Service Bus. Additionally, it also supports plugins, so you can hook it into things like SQL and Mongo. It can also support being hooked into logging providers like Nlog. And it also has a bunch of stuff around inversion of control containers. So things like Windsor, Autofact, etc., etc. Now, because we've got such a lot to cover in this video, I can't go into every single package. However, just to give you a glimpse of how it works, in Rebus, what you do is install a package, then you're going to get access to a queue, which you can start using start and stop. Now, when it comes to Rebus, you can configure things. So in your services, you can do things like set routing rules, transport rules, timeouts, logging, sagas. And in here, say we can define our queue. Next, we can send messages in our queue by using send. So you can see here, I'm passing this custom type. And then we've also got things like reply, or maybe we can defer messaging. Now, granted, that is a very simplified, quick overview of how Rebus works. However, hoping you can see that if you're working in distributed environments, then Rebus is a very simple, easy to use service bus that I highly recommend. Quartz.net is a scheduling library for managing tasks and jobs within your application. So if you need to execute jobs at specific times, create reoccurring tasks, or define complex cron-like expressions, then Quartz.net has you covered. So, some important factoids to mention. First, Quartz.net is built on .NET Core, .NET Standard 2.0, so nothing to worry about there. Next, it's been downloaded over 57 million times. Now, this means it's the most used scheduling tool in the marketplace. Now, if you've been using .NET for a while, you might have bumped into another popular package, which is called Hangfire. And a few watchers are probably thinking, what's the difference between this and Hangfire? So let's investigate. Okay. Well, Hangfire is also an open source framework for .NET, which allows you to easily schedule and manage background tasks. Now, Hangfire provides scheduling, persistent storage for the queue, and a dashboard to help you manage things. Now, at first glance, it probably sounds exactly the same as Quartz. However, there are some fundamental differences. Now, a simple way to think about things is that Quartz.NET is only focused on scheduling, and it's more a code implementation. Well, Hangfire is a all-in-one solution as it creates its own database tables, which it uses to store its jobs, and it also comes with UI-related things. Now, just in terms of scheduling configuration, Quartz.net has more capabilities compared to Hangfire, giving you more fine-grained control over when things are executed. Hmm. Now, with that theory covered, I always think it's fun to look at some code. Now, when it comes to Quartz, to get started, you're going to have to learn about triggers. Now, when you want to schedule your job up, you can define a trigger, you can give it a name. And then this is where Quartz is going to give you a bunch of functions on how you want that task to be sent. So first, you can define a start date using the start at method. After that, you can define when you want your task to be scheduled. So let's say you want to make a recurring task. We can do this with repeat count. We can also define how often the interval between our tasks gets scheduled. And let's say that we have lots and lots of things in the queue. You can prioritize which things that Quartz is going to schedule before others with this with priority method. Now, aside from this, 
if you actually want to send things with more fine grain control you can also use cron syntax so you can see here we've got this funky looking cron syntax which is going to define exactly when our task is going to get scheduled and then the remaining bits of code we've got here just show you how to set up a job so you can see we've got this job builder.create you can see here i'm passing in this custom type of custom job and underneath you can see i'm defining custom job by implementing from ijob interface and implementing this execute method here so the summary is pretty simple if you need to send scheduled jobs at certain time frames courts.net is going to tick all the boxes now it doesn't come with any of the bloat like its own custom database structure or ui you can simply install it hook it all up and off you go if you're writing an application that needs to make a bunch of mission critical api calls then poly is a package that you'll want to check out now when you're building an application that needs to make lots of api calls it's very hard to test when things go wrong in production in development all your api is going to be running however let's say you need to make a call to an external service and that's currently down what happens within your application now, using Poly, you can add additional rules in these worst case scenarios, hopefully making your application more resilient when things go wrong. And in production, this can be an essential mechanism to ensure that businesses don't lose money and customers are less likely to be impacted by your technology issues. Right, so let's see how we can implement this. Now, let's say we're making an HTTP call. You can see here I'm using an HTTP client calling this API. Now you can see that this code is wrapped inside of this policy. So in poly, you can do this policy.handle and you can trap any exception that you want to. Now, let's say that we want to do a retry policy. So we can use wait and retry. So what will happen is that if this call fails, what will happen is that after a set amount of time, it's going to retry it. So retry policy is really useful. However, poly has more up its sleeve. Now underneath, you can see an example of a circuit break pattern. So we're still using policy.handle, we're still trapping our exception, except for this time we can set it to be a circuit breaker. Now circuit breakers are really useful if you're making API calls and they hang and nothing happens. Because with a circuit breaker, as the name suggests, we can kill an API call if it gets stuck. And the final example I'm going to show you now is the wait and retry forever policy. Now this policy and this code is doing something a little bit more clever. Now instead of just doing a retry, we're going to add a little bit of intelligence into the process. So what's going to happen is we're going to retry. And if that fails, we're then going to wait a little bit longer before we try again. Then we're going to wait a little bit longer. Now, the purpose of doing this is that if something has fallen down, instead of just spamming it, we're going to give it a little bit of breathing room to get up and running again. Now, there's definitely way more examples I could cover. However, the summary is that Polly is going to give you a lot more control when you're making API calls. Now, when you're working on any application within a team, you're always going to need to deploy your code somewhere outside of your local machine. And with the ever-growing DevOps movement, writing scripts to automate the building of your code, the copying of it onto other servers, as well as the creation of any required infrastructure is an essential part of any good software development lifecycle. Now, traditionally, in order to create these scripts, you might be using something like XML, JSON, or YAML to define how things work. Now, this is NAF. Now, rather than being forced to define steps in config, it's obviously better to define things in code instead. And this is where Pulumi steps into the picture. So Pulumi is open source. It's been downloaded over 5 million times, and it's going to allow you to write C-sharp code to spin up different infrastructure. Now out of the box, Pulumi supports a bunch of stuff, including Google Cloud, Azure, Amazon AWS, as well as Kubernetes. Some other things that are probably worth pointing out about Pulumi is it supports more than just .NET. It's got SDKs for Python, Go, Java. There's a bunch of stuff. It supports all the CI, CD stuff you'd expect. Now, because there's so much, as you'd probably guess, it's not a free tool. Now, it is free for individual use. However, as a team, you have to pay for it. Now, I wouldn't say that Pulumi is the most easiest package to master. However, there's good news because they provide lots of code samples to help you get up and running. 
Now, if you go over to GitHub, Halloumi slash examples and scroll down, you can see that they've got examples how to spin things up with AWS, Azure, GCP. We've got Kubernetes. There's a bunch of stuff. So let's look at this Azure resource example. Now, for anyone who doesn't understand Azure, this code is going to make zero sense. However, it will hopefully give you a good understanding about what Pulumi does. Now, in Azure, we have something called a resource group. So Pulumi basically gives you all the objects, all the types in order to spin up all these different resources online or in the cloud. So you can see here we've got things like a resource group storage account we've got an app service plan we've got a blob container we've got blobs and these all map to azure related things now in order to spin up our infrastructure as we deploy it you can see that we can configure these objects with different settings now granted sometimes spinning up certain resources is quite complex as you can see here this class is 150 lines however the benefit of using code is one it's in source control Two, it means that when people change things, it can go through your peer review process. And three, because you're using code, you can even unit test this stuff if you want to. And this is way more robust compared to trying to do everything in JSON or YAML and accidentally making small mistakes. Because here, you can use the compiler to make sure that everything is correct. If you want to increase the odds that you ship bug-free software, you'll need to write unit tests. And in order to write the best possible unit test, you should use as accurate dummy data as possible. Now, this is where Bogus comes into the equation. Bogus is based on an amazing JavaScript library called Faker. And if you're a JS dev, I recommend that you look at that package as well. Now, for C Sharp, Bogus will provide you with a bunch of utils that can support generating pretty much any type of test data that you need. Now, Bogus has been downloaded over 54 million times and it supports C Sharp, F Sharp and BB.net. Now, because Bogus contains so much and it's pretty easy to pick up, I can't cover everything in this brief overview. However, I've gone over to the Bogus GitHub and looking at the documentation, you can see in terms of fake data, you can generate things like addresses and you have a bunch of different properties. So we've got counties, countries, cities. We've got commercy related things. So prices, categories, product names, colors. We've got company related data that we can generate. We can also generate date related things. So future dates, present dates, past dates. There's finance related things. So credit card numbers, account names. There's image related stuff. We can generate fake internet data. So emails, username, IP addresses. We can generate random text using Lorem Ipsum. There's name related stuff phone number related stuff, there's PC file system related stuff, so file paths, file name extensions, there's vehicle related data we can generate. Right, I'm cutting this here, the list is too long, I got bored, but basically in essence you can generate any type of fake data with Bogus that you can imagine. And what's more, if it's not supported out of the box, Bogus also has a plugin architecture and a bunch of developers have created additional plugins to generate even more data. Finally, I don't think I can finish this video without mentioning Fluent Validation and Fluent Assertions. Now, my assumption is that most watchers will be aware of these packages. However, for those of you who haven't come across them, go download them now because they're essentials. Now, a development related fact is that all developers will spend more time reading code than actually writing it. And basically, no one likes to waste time trying to decipher what some code does or what the intention of a unit test might actually be. So both of these packages are going to allow you to write your code in a way that's going to make it much easier for someone to read them later on. OK, so that was a bold claim. Let's look at each package now and see how it can improve code readability. And we're going to start with fluid assertions. Now, over the years, I've forced about 100 developers to have to use Fluent Assertions. So I know from first-hand experience, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to pick up. Now, what will happen in your unit test is you're going to do some sort of expression, you're going to get a result, and you want to test that result for a certain condition. So let's say that ID here or description is our result. What we can do is use the should method from the Fluent API, and then you're going to have about 40 or 50 different extensions to test that condition. We're going to have things like be true, be false. We can test it against specific values. We can test it for null, empty, null, 
there's basically a bunch of bunch of stuff and hopefully we can all agree that if you had a unit test scanning it like this so id should be null or empty is much easier and much more declarative compared to id equals equals null and the fluent validations api looks very similar the difference is instead of targeting unit tests we're going to target actual validations in our code so before we finish i'll quickly show you one way of using fluent validation so one thing you can do is create a custom validator by inheriting from abstract validator and you can type it now within the constructor you can define your validation rules and you can make use of this rule for method now the extension has a bunch of extensions just like the assertion so we've got things like not null validate email addresses not empty we've got length and you can chain these up now when you're happy with your validator one way of accessing it is just newing it up passing in your type and you're going to get validation now adding in rules like this hopefully we can agree is much easier to understand and because we've got it in a custom validator it's much more easy to reuse as well so that covers the list and i hope you found a hidden gem among them now i only scratched the surface on all of those packages and let me know in the comments below if you want me to do a deep dive on anything in particular now before we part ways don't forget to smash on the subscribe button and if you like this video click on like now i do a video every single sunday that will help you to become a better developer so you know what to do additionally if you'd like to learn more about .NET, then i've recorded a video on the best new features that have been added to visual studio 2022 since its launch so i recommend you check that out the link to that's on screen right now otherwise have a great day and happy coding Additionally, it also supports plugins, so you can hook it into things like SQL and Mongo. It can also support being hooked into logging providers like Nlog, and it also has a bunch of stuff around inversion of control containers, so things like Windsor, Autofact, etc., etc.